In the 20 years I've been practicing surgery, I've never seen anything like this. We were dealing in uncharted territory. He described uh, this constellation of symptoms that were just outlandish and beyond belief. I knew that I wasn't uh, crazy. There was something really physiological happening to me. I am Commander Robert Buchanan, and I am a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. March 19th of 2006, I was on board the USS Ronald Reagan, and I launched from the aircraft carrier for a combat mission in northern Iraq. And the mission was a great success, but I had a mechanical malfunction that led to a rapid decompression of the cockpit. I remember waking to the sound of my wingman yelling at me on the radio, making sure that I was okay because my aircraft was in some sort of an unusual attitude. I wasn't of complete mental faculty at that point. Something had happened. I made it back aboard the ship uh, with some phenomenal help from the landing signal officers. They realized that with the limited medical capabilities on the ship, they were going to have to medevac me someplace else. I was the first physician at Stanford to see Commander Buchanan, and his uh, presentation was highly unusual. I was able to, at one point, physically push along my neck and be able to get, it sounded like a frog, quite frankly, where there was air escaping from somewhere in my neck. Dr. Damrose, the first time I met him, spent over two hours of his day with me, just getting the patient history. Stanford University is unique in the fact that they will take the time to listen to what the patient's saying, no matter how crazy it may sound. When we actually looked at the imaging, it appeared that he had an air-filled sac in the neck. Air usually means something has perforated or is leaking. So this was creating serious problems for a pilot. We were very concerned what would happen to him at high altitude. In the worst case scenario, air extravasating throughout the body can kill a person. So he had been grounded. When we explored the neck, what we found was that there was a type of encapsulated collection of air, something called a pseudocyst. So I took that capsule out, but it was not coming from the capsule in the neck. And so the most helpful thing I did was to discuss the case with Dr. Nyack. We went through his CAT scan. I said there's a possibility of a potential space that might exist in one part of the sinuses, but I don't see those things in this CAT scan. There are areas in his nasal cavity that looked physically entirely normal, but when you contacted the areas, they were just exquisitely tender, to the point that Robert was jumping out of the chair. When there's no protocol, a lot of it was, I've seen enough of these other things that look kind of like this, let's try this. And so it became a process of, let's make each step of the way logical and reversible. If we can close off the entry site and or close off the exit site, we would be in a good place. We started to call it a sinocervical fistula, which became a very reasonable hypothesis at this point. So the serendipity came in with me just saying, let me just take care of your sinuses because you do have sinus problems on your CAT scan. So after a fairly routine sinus surgery on both sides, I started placing cotton patties on that area. When I did that, the air passage into his neck stopped. But at that point, he really started complaining of eye problems. Do you have any numbness in your teeth or gums? Dr. Kostler and Dr. Shaw, both fantastic surgeons, came in because Dr. Nayak realized there was something going on with my left eye. We first started by doing a dacryocystogram, which is basically an x-ray of the tear ducts. We didn't find a fistula, but we did find a very abnormal tear duct. So we took him to a procedure to close the exit of the duct and the entry of the duct. But like every other procedure we had done on him, then there was a new, different symptom. But what we learned every time with Robert is that every time we performed something, it made him marginally a little bit better. Finally, he started complaining more of the base of tongue area and the throat area. And so Dr. Damros performed a, a small base of tongue surgery as well. His base of tongue problems went away. Until finally, we came down to one major symptom that no one can really explain, which was extreme tenderness behind the left nostril. And eventually, I placed an alloderm graft as a way of kind of blockading this area of sensitivity for him. Miraculously, he's never had air trapping in his neck ever since then. One thing that I realized about Stanford University that everybody else talks about, and that is the cross-specialty communication. If I didn't have that, I don't think I ever truly would have had a resolution to this very cryptic case. This one man brought all of us together in an incredibly collaborative, 
know, a genuine way. And what we learned is that no matter how outlandish some patient symptoms are, you have to try to take time to listen to them and listen to their complaints and try to think outside the box and get them in a better place in their life. He was very self-educated in medically what was going on. This guy wanted to solve this, he wanted to get back into the cockpit and he was willing to do whatever it took to solve the problem. He finally passed his flight simulator test and is back in active duty with the Navy. Everyone around me can attest to the fact that an aviator who is grounded is not a happy person. It affected my view of myself, and I felt like to be complete, I needed to get back to flying. I had my first flight about a week and a half ago. I feel like my life was given back to me, thanks to the great doctors here uh, at Stanford.